What if I told you there's a simple way to design steel columns without second guessing your calculations and it's easier than you think? The sad truth is that many engineers today are overcomplicating steel column design or worse, they're making costly mistakes. In today's video, I'll show you a straightforward approach that works every time. Let's talk about the loads acting on a column. The compression load is simply the total of the reactions from the beams connected to the column. Pretty simple. In this example, the blue beam has a reaction of 80 kN, the red beam is 160 kN, the pink beam 130 and the yellow beam is 90 kN. When we add them all up, we get 460 kN. That's like stacking 46 small cars on top of your column. And that means our goal is to design this column so it can safely carry more than 460 kN in compression. These reactions come from ultimate limit state ULS load combinations like your 1.2G plus 1.5Q, 1.35G. And if you're using a structural analysis software, you can simply check the axial force diagram instead of calculating it manually. And even though we have pin connections, meaning no bending moment is transferred to the columns, we still need to account for bending due to eccentricity of connections. Why? Well, because life isn't perfect, nothing's perfect, except for me. And the load doesn't act perfectly in line with the column's center. It's slightly offset. This small shift creates a bending moment that we need to factor into our design. Clause 4.3.4 of AS4100 states that we must consider a minimum eccentricity of 100 millimeters in the connection between the beam and the column. To determine the bending moment from eccentricity, we assume that the beam transfer its load to the column along a line of bolts. This means the eccentricity is calculated as half the column's width plus the distance from the column face to the load line. According to the code, this minimum distance is 100 millimeters, which is usually a reasonable assumption. However, if the actual connection detail results in a larger distance, then we should use the greater value instead. Let's take a 89 SHS tubular column as an example. The eccentricity equals 89 millimeters divided by two plus 100 millimeters. That works out to be 144.5 millimeters or 0.1445 meters. Now in this case, loads are coming from both sides, which means their moments will partially cancel each other out. One side tries to rotate left while the other side tries to rotate right. So we take the difference between the highest and lowest reactions. 130 kilonewtons minus 80 kilonewtons equals 50 kilonewtons. And finally, using the moment formula, moment equals force times distance, 50 kilonewtons times 0.1445 meters equals 7.22 kilonewton meter. And that's the bending moment we need to consider. We follow the same process for the other beams and find a bending moment of 10.11 kilonewton meter. This bending moment acts in the Y axis, so we call it MY. Now we have MX 7.22 and MY 10.11. Now that we know the forces acting on the column, we need to perform three important checks. First one is axial compression check. We have to make sure the column can handle the compression load. Number two, the bending moment check. That's where we consider the moment caused by eccentricity or any other bending forces. And number three, combined bending and axial check. We have to ensure the column is safe under both compression and bending. Step number one, checking compression alone. First, we need to determine the effective length factor Ke. This factor adjusts the actual column length to account for how its ends are supported. So here's a reference table from AS4100 that helps us find Ke for different support conditions. For a braced or sway column, when a compression force is applied, the column buckles in a specific shape. And for a braced member, the effective length factor Ke for fixed fixed is 0.7, fixed pin is 0.85, pinned pin Ke equals 1. 
For sway members, when the column is free to move laterally, the values are different. For example, a portal frame fixed at the base, rotation fixed at the top, but translation free, Ke equals 1.2. If it's pinned at the base, free to sway at the top, Ke equals 2.2. A cantilever column fixed at the base, free at the top, Ke equals 2.2. The difference between a braced and a sway frame, even when they have the same end fixities, comes down to rigidity or stiffness. A braced frame is much more stiff and rigid because it has bracing elements, like diagonal members or shear walls, that will prevent lateral movement. And this makes the column more stable and reduces its tendency to buckle, resulting in a lower effective length factor Ke. A sway frame, on the other hand, doesn't have bracing to resist lateral movement, meaning the frame members must take on the horizontal loads themselves. This makes them less rigid or stiff, more flexible, and more prone to buckling, leading to a higher Ke value. That's why, even if the end conditions look the same, the frame behavior changes how we calculate buckling resistance. So it's important to consider the overall structure, not just the end fixities of the column. For example, even if a column is fixed pinned, you can't always use Ke equals 0.85. If the frame behaves like two cantilever columns swaying, it should be treated as a sway frame with Ke equals 2.2 instead. In our residential course project inside our community of structural engineers that you can find a link in the description below, we will assume a braced pin pin system. This means we will consider the house to have enough bracing walls distributed throughout, ensuring that the overall frame is stable and does not sway. Because of this, we can safely use Ke equals 1 in our column design. Let's go through a couple more examples to make sure we are on the same page about effective length. Imagine this middle column that is pinned at both ends and carrying compression loads. Since there are cross bracings at both ends, the column cannot sway laterally. This means it behaves like a pinned pinned braced column. So the buckling shape will look like an S curve. Because it's well braced, the effective length LE is equal to the actual column length L. So in this case, we use Ke equals one. If you look at the roof plane view, you will notice that even columns not directly aligned with the bracing base can still have Ke equals one, as long as the roof bracing is properly designed and installed. The roof bracing helps distribute loads across the structure, effectively tying all the columns together. In this next case, if you are unsure, the safest approach is to assume the effective length as the height of two stories. And why? Because the column is effectively restrained at the bracing locations, which are at each second story. If we assume the intermediate floor does not provide lateral restraint, then the column would buckle over two stories rather than just one. This approach is conservative, meaning we are designing on the safer side. But is it 100% accurate? Not necessarily. The real question is, can the intermediate floor help restrain the column? If the intermediate level and supports are stiff enough and can properly transfer lateral loads, then it could provide lateral restraint, reducing the effective length to just one story. To find an accurate value for the effective length, you can run a buckling analysis in your software. For many cases, I personally find hard to accurately find the effective length. For example, in a portal frame end bay with the central column, to decide if Ke equals 1 for a pin pin central column, you have to assume that the portal frame itself has a certain minimum sway stiffness to effectively brace the top of the column. If it does, this portal frame wouldn't be considered a sway frame and we could safely use Ke equals 1. So make sure you understand the overall system behavior before you make any assumptions. 
Let's quickly go over an important concept about how columns in compression can fail. There are two types of failure in steel columns. There's local failure, and this happens when the material crushes due to excessive stress or individual plate elements buckle before the whole column fails. This type of failure is related to the section capacity of the column. And the second one is the whole member failure, which is buckling. And this occurs when the entire column buckles under compression. This failure is influenced by column slenderness and effective length, and this is related to the member capacity. So section capacity ensures the column can resist crushing and local buckling, while member capacity ensures the column won't fail due to overall buckling. So in simple terms, when you design a column for compression, find the KE for X and Y axis, because a column can buckle about the major or minor axis depending on the restraint locations. Determine the effective length, so go to our engineering second brain, find the member moment capacity for X and Y axis, and choose an appropriate column size. If you forget any steps, you can go through this page in our second brain, explaining everything in more details. When we hear the word column, we usually think of a member in compression. But in real life, columns are never just in pure compression. They always experience some level of bending moment. That's why we refer to them as bend columns instead of just columns. And where do these bending moments come from? So it could come from fixed connections. For example, in a portal frame, the column is part of a rigid joint, meaning bending moments are transferred into the column. It could come from loads acting directly on the column. For example, wind loads apply pressure on a surface connected to the column, causing it to bend as it transfers those loads to the foundation. It could come from secondary loads in axial members. Even if a truss is designed to take only axial loads, if you place the purlins in between the truss nodes, that will introduce reactions that cause bending in the top cord of the truss. And it could also come from eccentric vertical loads. And this offset or eccentricity creates additional bending moments that must be considered. All right, before we proceed, the first point I wanted to touch upon is second order effects. So imagine you're holding a straight ruler on a table. Oh, I mean, this one's not really straight. This is actually a great representation of how real life columns are. They're never 100% straight. They come out of factory with all sorts of imperfections. Anyway, if you push straight down on it, nothing much happens. It just compresses. Now try pushing down while slightly tilting to one side. You will see that the more it bends, the more it wants to bend even further. And this is called second order effects and it happens when forces and deformations interact. That means we have an increase in bending moment and deflection. There are two ways you can account for that. First one is to run a first order analysis and apply a moment amplification factor. And the second way is to run a second order analysis. Any software nowadays has a second order analysis included in their analysis package. Therefore, if you're modeling the structure, you might as well just run a second order analysis. In this example, we have a load of 100 kilonewtons applied at an eccentricity of 500 millimeters to the center line of the column. Therefore, through a first order analysis, the bending moment is 100 kilonewtons times 500 millimeters or 0.5 meters that equals 50 kilonewton meter. Easy, right? And it deflects 111.61 millimeters to the side and 23.62 millimeters down. On the other hand, if we run a second order analysis, the bending moment goes from 50 to 63.7 kilonewton meter and the deflection to 136.97 millimeters and 27.66 millimeters. Now that we understand all the fundamentals, we can set up a plan of attack. So step number one, we design the column for compression loads alone. Step number two, we design the column for bending the same way we designed a beam in the videos golden rules of steel beam design. And then finally, step number three, we're going to quickly check the column for combined compression and bending. 
So we've gone through step number one and number two. And now for combined actions at the very basic level, we have to ensure that the ratio of applied actions to resistance is equal or less than one. If you're watching this from Europe or Canada, you will notice the equations are a little different because the Canadian and European equations are based on first order moment with amplification factor. The American and Australian equations are based on second order bending moments. But essentially in all these codes, we still have to check for uniaxial bending about the major principal axis uniaxial bending about the minor principal axis and for bending about the minor axis we only need to check the in-plane capacity because out-of-plane capacity is related to lateral torsional buckling and if the bending is about the minor axis lateral torsional buckling won't happen for minor axis bending the failure mode is always in-plane buckling and then biaxial bending moment. If the column is subjected to biaxial bending, we perform these two checks for section and member capacity. A biaxial bending example is the first image I showed in the beginning of the video with the colored beams coming from all directions. This video would be perfect if we had time to talk about buckling analysis. But I'm sure you have other things to do as well. I don't because I'm stranded in a cyclone in Queensland. But if you've made it to here and would like a video on column buckling analysis, comment the golden rules of buckling analysis. If there are more than 20 comments, I'll make a video. Otherwise, I'll talk about something else. Again, link for our structural engineering community in the description below. This is what our students are saying so far. So get in quick because we close doors soon and I'll see you in the next video.